I think I think I took that picture. Classic. I think I took that picture. Well, you, you straight. <laughs> Not all of them. I know. You ever tell one story where I thought he was going to stab me, but it was a hairbrush. Bony? What's happening? 
Where the hell's the old man hiding? Another one, huh? Three or four? I know. I'm kind of looking for her. Yeah. Yeah, I've been, I finally got <laughs> off the, the melatonin. No. Uh, I was using did that, that for work? A while. Yeah, yeah, I was working, but I, I noticed that I had to take a little more, like gradually. I started off with the threes and then went into the fives and the sixes. And I tried melatonin for the. Stopping you. I know. <laughs> but I really am going to eat that food. Does it bother you when you sit in there? No, no, no. Uh, Undo? No, it's 
You're doing good. We can hear you. Yeah, I'll just talk loud. I'm good. Talk loud. I'm a school teacher. I'll try too. Um, so I'm Chief Sister-in-law Karen. I don't. I think I at least met everybody. Um, I want. Steve is a storyteller, so we're going to tell some stories today. Um, I've got a couple. Uh, so please do. He, you know, he brought a lot of joy. A lot of people have talked about like the vibe that's here. That guy, you just love him, you know. You just love him. So my stories are. <laughs> so uh, I've been Steve's brother-in-law for, I mean sister-in-law for over 40 years. Um, but more than that. He's been more like a brother to a number of my brothers to me, so he's my brother. But even more than that, he was my friend, you know? He just was my friend. And it was such a privilege to be in his circle, to be in his inner circle, like to call me every day and go on vacation with and have barbecues with. And it's always it's such a blessing in that regard. And the other day, my neighbor called Paul's cell phone. I wasn't going to answer. I didn't want to get up. It didn't get answered. So the, the house phone rang. I'm like, oh crap. Steve did that to me every day. The cell, cell phone would go off. No one answered. The, oh, it must be Steve. The house phone's ringing now. So that's kind of what his little deal. But uh, anyway, one thing I wanted to say, there's a couple stories, but one thing I want to say about him and his love of people, because these are his people right here is um, his love for his nieces and nephews. Because he, he would have been an amazing dad, but he was a dad to everybody else. He was a dad to my boys. He was a dad to his nieces, all his nieces and nephews. And he was a dad to their friends, you know? That's just how he rolled. But uh, one of the stories I wanted to say, I've talked about, and it's not as very flattering about me, but it is. It's a story that he would always tell about me, and I didn't really like it, but I'm going to tell it. <laughs> so I tend to be kind of a ball baby, just kind of how I'm put together. Although I feel like I've toughened up in recent years. I don't cry as much, except for the last three, four months. It's been pretty horrendous. But I, I don't cry as much. So, But when I was younger, cry when you're mad, cry when you're sad, cry when you're happy. It's just the way it was. So... He would pop in. Well, first of all, he'd come to my house, get my kids all riled up and crying, and then leave. He was notorious for that. <laughs> and uh, so they were little. Paul was gone all the time. He was just fishing. So he comes in, you know, he walks in the door. Well, apparently, I don't even remember this. I just remember because he told the story so many times. So he comes, uh, we were all in the bedroom and we were crying. For, I was probably overwhelmed. 
and he walks in my bedroom and I could hear his voice. He said, Karen, Steve, this is not a good time. You know, he'd always say that. You know, Karen is like, Steve, this is not a good time. Well, obviously. So that's one of his little stories. Like how she. Um, so the other story I was going to say, this is a hard one. So, you know, that cancer just wanted to take him out real quick and it just happened overnight and we're there with him when he was passing and the chaplain comes in and they pray with the family you know and um so and i don't remember who was there i think it was dave paul guy susie maybe sam was there um myself and we we're praying over him and and everything and the lord gave me a picture and it was a picture of a tapestry and how the threads are all intertwined and Steve is the common thread. And if you think about that thread of family in that hospital room, but the, the, the thread of his nieces and nephews and the thread of the great nieces and nephews and the thread of all his dearest friends and the threads of the people he used to work with. And, and he's that common thread of this tapestry of life that we're going on with, you know. And so I just thought that was kind of a beautiful picture of how he makes those connections for us because he was like the connector, the glue, you know? Um, and there's one little thing that I want to read. I don't know if I have it with me. Um, maybe I won't. But it's just kind of about, this day is about for us on how to deal with not having Steve here day to day with us and how we can relate to him in our heart and, and spiritually or you know whatever it is that that memory brings you know that's only with the only thing that we take with us when we leave are the memories that we leave behind and so those are the things that we need to focus on is the memories and when you walk in on the beach to think of him or when you're in the woods you worked in the woods for years to think of him or whatever that that precious memory that jogs that to bring joy to you and not grief because he wants us to be joyous he was joyous and jolly and giving and generous well that was the other thing i want to say um so i was thinking about his character and i talked i spoke about him being so generous and kind of being a natural caretaker and i felt like he was kind of a superhero he's like mr generous in um, Captain Caretaker, you know, and I just feel like he's our superhero. Um, so I, I do want you guys to tell stories. Uh, and if you feel like when you come up, if you feel like you need someone to stand by you, would you do that for the person that comes next? Okay. So that's, that's what I have to say. Does anybody else have stories? I know there's a doggone lot of them. <laughs> oh, by the way, there's uh, little handout deals. There's little Steve-isms. Maybe I better read those. Shit, the phone's Oh, man, I might need that. Um, so we were talking about Steve-isms. Like smoking and drinking? And so my niece kind of made Passing this little... stuff around. What's that? Passing stuff around. Passing stuff around. Don't so take one of these, me. put it in your wallet. You can, when you need a Steveism, here they are. And he always had a name for himself. The one, I, one that I forgot was Toledo Steve. He was Toledo Steve. Mr. Hughley. Hughie, Hugh, Steve-O, Lanny. Ugly with an H. What's the scoop? What's the skinny? Well, I heard, but I don't say nothing. Don't be lying to me. Shit to bunk. GTO. Just like a son of a gun. Eat shit and bark out the moon. What's her, his or hers dangle? Can, I, can you hear me now? Yeah. Let me now. your cockroach, meatloaf, and your pussy will. Hung like a field mouse. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yippers. Yippers. Were you in the boat when it tipped over? Heck no, silly. I was in the water. <laughs> Lanny you, Steven. You oh, you want to tell that one, Sheila? Come on, you tell Come on, it. Come on, Sheila. 
Yeah, good, tell it, Sheila. I know exactly what you want you to say. Come on, Sheila. You can do it. Yeah, just sit. His favorite joke. We're all flying, Sheila. You can do it. You can do it. Yay, Sheila. You can play the whale. Come back to the horse. Four skin divers. Four skin divers. How do you circumcise the whale? Four skin divers. <laughs> May you rest in peace while still keeping us laughing. And that's what keeps us laughing. That's a lot of people's favorite. All right. So we have Susan, um, and you can introduce yourself because you're a big girl. I'm Steve's older sister, Susan, and uh, Steve um, asked me to tell the story. He was about two and a half years old, and we lived in uh, Charleston. We just moved up from Scotia, California, and uh, I had gotten into trouble. Steve was, uh, I'm seven years older than Steve, and... Uh, I was sitting on uh, some wood next to our wood stove and I'd gotten into trouble and I was crying and Steve came up to me, he was probably two, two and a half years old. He comes up to me and I tell this story because this is my brother Steve. And I can tell you at a very early age, two, two and a half years old, he was a loving, caring little boy. He comes up to me and I'm crying and he goes, wipes my tears away and he goes, I love you, Stevie loves you. And he was wiping my tears away. And we'd been outside, so his hands were dirty. And so he wipes my tears away. And he starts laughing. And he's trying to say raccoon. And I, I don't understand it. And I just start bawling more. And he goes in the bedroom. And he gets my father's uh, shaving mirror. And he holds it up to me. And I look like a raccoon. <laughs> and I, and uh, Stevie loves you. Stevie loves you. And I remember that. And um, sometimes when life is difficult, it throws an eight ball at you. I think about my brother Steve and what he said when he was little, uh, that he loved me. And I think about the uh, when he showed me the picture of my face and I look like a raccoon. <coughs> and it tells me at a very early age, he had a sense of humor and he was loving. He comes to me, his older sister, who's gotten in trouble, and he tells me that he loves me. Anyway, that was uh, my brother Steve. He loved everybody. Nobody was a stranger. And he was kind and caring and generous. <coughs> Guy and I worried about him because he gave his money away left and right. And uh, it's just the way he was. And uh, sometimes he didn't uh, loan people money. He gave it. And my husband would get kind of upset with him. Steve, we're going to have to take care of you when you're an old man. You're not going to have any money. <laughs> And he says, that will be the day. And those little Stevens-isms that we were talking about, um, he'd call on the phone, can you hear me now? Does that ring a bell with anybody? Can you hear me now? And he's like, give me the scoop. And don't you lie to me. And it's just the little things that everybody has heard and remembers. And uh, thank you for coming uh, to his celebration of life. Well, I got a whole bunch of shit stories. Both <laughs> loaded. Are you the brother? One of the brothers. I'm going to keep it real simple and sweet. Well, I don't know how many of you guys are fishermen here. A few. I don't know how many of you guys know the old head rope unit. CN10. You throw it on the net. Fling everything out. Gosh, and there's a picture, and on and on we're going along, and God, I call him Mad Dog Ben. That's about as far as you can go for a skipper. And the guy's going, gosh, damn it, I can't believe this guy's I see all these fish and nothing's going in, nothing's going. He fished about 40 minutes, bring the damn net up, what's going on? Okay, we brought the net up. He runs out there in the back, gets the room, who the hell put that on backwards? <laughs> and we're looking at each other going, well, that'd be me and Steve, one of us or both of us. And he goes, shit, I've been missing schools and schools of fish. And my brother Steve looks at him and goes, 
well, if this is backwards, that means steer it behind you. You weren't ever going to catch them. <laughs> so, that's one good one. <coughs> then another time, it's me, Steve, like Mike Mallard, coming back from Alaska. Tuna fishing on the way home. Oh, shit, in the morning. I had the early morning shift, whatever the hell time it was for me. Three to seven, whatever the hell it was. Something simple. And I had their jigs out and this and that going along there. God, we started catching tuna fish and I'm hauling, getting everybody, oh God, yeah, tuna on everywhere. I mean, tuna fish just flying on boats. Boom, 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 boom. And uh, bite was off. Bam. Weighed about a half hour. So they go in and start making, and then I scream, oh God, fish on. I go bailing out the damn wheelhouse down the steps, running towards the back of the boat, slip and hit a big old chain weight, slammed my leg big time. I'm pulling in this big old fish, big old, big old albacore. And my brother Steve's got the big gaff, and then I finally get it up there, and they come out, and about the third, and I mean, it's a huge albacore, I'm freaking. And Kerr, bam, he hits it in the head, and off it goes. <laughs> and he's like, well, it wasn't your fish anyways. <laughs> but no, I got a lot of stories about Steve. I mean, gee, I go on forever. Another one that comes to mind is when we're kids riding bicycles. One had brakes and one didn't have brakes. <laughs> so we're riding down this damn hill, going like a bat out of hell. And you should put your foot down and slow down. Well, there wasn't no slowing down. So Steve thought he just kind of bumped me. So when he bumped me, he flipped. When he flipped, he hit the ground. I remember he split his lip big time. I just felt so bad. And there's just blood pouring everywhere. And I'm looking at him. His lip is stuck through his teeth. And I can take his lip up like this and drop it. <laughs> and I was, you know, just... Childhood memories, of yeah. shit yeah. in the fan. Oh, you know. But now he's a good guy, and he did love a lot of people, and he did care a lot about people. And you know, like he said, hell, you ain't taking nothing with you. Mm. It don't matter. You know, but he said, the one you can have is you know, a whole bunch of love, and just give it away. And he did. He, I, I know damn well it, there ain't too many people my brother didn't like. Maybe a few would piss him off, but he never hated them. Yeah. He just wants people to piss at him at least once. <laughs> Other than that, somebody else can tell a good story now. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to find out on the wall. Okay, we'll use my wall. That's all right, hey. Carry on. My name's Dave. I'm uh, Steve's nephew. Uh, don't have. A particular story I just like to share you know what uh, what Uncle Steve was to me um, Uncle Steve helped me out I uh, I got in a lot of trouble as a youngster and uh, well I made it awful hard to be employable and sometimes even likable you know and Uncle Steve was always there for me and uh, he always made sure that you know, he had some little shit job, sorry, but they were shit jobs, because that's what I was capable of doing back then. You know, you had me a split maul or a shovel, and I was your guy, you know, and I could carry heavy stuff. And, uh, you know, I got to help him out around uh, his house in Toledo, you know. Uh, got to... Uh, I, I got to help him rebuild his foundation underneath that house. And again, shovel and wheelbarrow, because you know I'm good at that and I'm really good with the shovel. You know, he's, I'm sure he's very proud of my shoveling skills. And, uh, and you know, later on, he was always looking out for me. When I was with uh, Jen, Devin's, Devin's mother, I was with her for five years. You know, most of the time we were broke. It wouldn't matter if I was working four jobs. We were broke. And they'd be like, oh, well, shit, old, uh, who was that weirdo out there on Fruitvale? The mechanic? John Towselbutt. Yeah, old Johnny Towsley. <laughs> oh, hell, he's a drunk. He's probably got $100 in cans. You know, just go bring your Nissan out there, you know. So I'd go out there. No, he had more like three or $400 in cans. He, he paid our rent that much. You know, and Steve was always looking out for me. Um, I got to the, the mummified cat oh, under the house. The mummified kidder? <laughs> yeah, there was a mummified kidder underneath the house. I got to remove the kidder. I don't know where he was. But uh, no, 
know, I got to help him build a house up in Washington. Um, it pissed him off so bad, I thought uh, that sweetheart of a human being was going to pound me. And, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever seen Steve Hughley mad. But I'll take Paul, and I'll take Dino, and I'll take Uncle Dave before I'd even think about, you know, <laughs> Uncle Steve, because he scared the snot out of me. And thank God he didn't beat my ass, but... I got to grow up a little bit that day, you know, I got to learn a life lesson. I got checked by an alpha male. And he wasn't the type of alpha male that was a bully. He wasn't loud. He was just a good guy that showed you a better way to live, you know. He's more caring and got a bigger heart than uh, I've ever had. And uh, it was an honor to be his nephew. It was an honor to love that man. It was an honor to be able to spend the time with him. And he's not one of them relatives where I feel like, oh, I shoulda, coulda, woulda, bullshit. I was there, you know, and I, and I was a part of his life and he was a part of mine. There's no unfinished business with Steve and I, you know? He was just a great role model, you know? He showed me how to care. He, he showed me generosity. And I like to think that maybe I picked up a little bit of that. And uh, that's cool. So I don't have one particular story. I got friggin' hundreds, you know? And there ain't enough time. I got one more I gotta share. <laughs> he brought it up. They were digging into doing all this work. And you know, we can stop by and look at the work done in the house. <laughs> The floor was undone. Steve was down there. Sheila had a 16 ounce brand new friggin' hammer in her hand. She's a boy, <laughs> wobbling and talking to BL. It goes like this, and it goes like this. And Steve's down there looking up, and her wham! He hit him right between the eyes. And it's a damn good thing he was under there because he was pissed. <laughs> Remember that, Sheila? <laughs> My name is uh, Mary Haga Davis. <coughs> From Nye Beach. <laughs> Nye Beach. Cindy and the Hughley family lived across the street from us on Brook Street. Their mom, my mom, were best friends. And Steve and Paul were on my front steps every morning with my two younger brothers, Russell and Robin. And they were like four little mus musketeers yeah. together. You would not, you would catch them at the same time. They must have been about what? There wasn't even school yet. No. No, I think they probably were about four or five years old. And every, yeah, and every Friday, my mom would bake homemade bread. And Steve knew it. <laughs> he was at the door before anybody else got up wanting to help my mom so he could get some of that bread. <laughs> But he was a wonderful person, he really was, even when he was real little. And I enjoyed being part of the Hubie family for the last almost, what? 60? 60 or more years, yeah. So, and it's been great. They're all wonderful. But, you know, and Steve was more of a brother to me. Well, Steve and Paul were like my little brothers because they were around my little brothers so much. So, but I have really enjoyed Steve's company over the years. Yeah. A story about that uh, at, right after school, we got out of school at 3.30, we were on your doorstep because what came on at 4 o'clock? American Bandstand. Band. Oh, yeah. And that's where we learned to do the swing and a bunch of other dances. <laughs> Uh, and that's where we saw Paul Reiner and the Raider right. for the first time. First time. Yes. And then we had that big room where Mom had the washer and dryer after yes. it was empty, and we yes. had to go back there and play records and play dance records all we and want. Dance. And yeah. the boys were so funny when they went that way. Yes. Oh, we gosh, had a yeah. good time up there. Yeah, we yeah. did. Yeah, that and was we another went story. To the yeah. 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 All right. All right. Shower, so we're good. Watch where you're walking. 
<laughs> no fire pits out here. <laughs> well, three of them that were forgotten in the sayings was microsite, copacetic, and the worm is turned. Maybe uh, Bob remembers those from back in the tree planting days. <laughs> Steve was always saying that. Yep. Back then, we didn't have the straps over the shoulders with the tree bag. We had the single strap around the waist and it cut into you all day, carrying what, 200 trees, you know? But, uh, you know, the Hughleys and the Glasscocks, as far as I can remember back, I mean, I was three, four years old. We lived in Nye Beach, they lived in Nye Beach. You know, we've been like family all these years. Teresa reminded me of a story last night. There was a there was a band playing. I guess it was a Durangler uptown or something where old Jake's used to be. And uh, Steve was hot on the lead singer girl of the band. <laughs> <laughs> so he was trying to talk the band into having lunch with us the next day, go down and have some chowder. And they said, "Sure, we'll beat you down there." So I'm not sure where they were from, whatever, but. We all sat down, started eating our chowder, and the girl goes, well, what kind of chowder is this? <laughs> and, he, and I just took a bite of chowder, and he says, it's called cream of some young man. <laughs> it was coming out my nose. I think I blew it up on the other side of the table. <laughs> and I'm so glad Teresa remembered that one last night. <laughs> You know, I just have always loved him like a brother, and you know, it's hard to believe that he's gone. Hughley family, I love every, each, each and every one of you. Actually, I even got this one. Oh. So, there's nothing, none of you here don't know about Steve. None of you. You know it all. Every bit of it. Steve was an artist. You just didn't see his paintings. Because he left his art on each and every one of you, including me. He loved, loved his brothers, loved them, and he mastered a friendship with them that no one else can have. He is like, they're my brothers, and I'm going to master something that no one can replace or take. And he was just so, just did it so well. And he's got two sisters. <laughs> well, he tried to master us. <laughs> no, we're older than him. He can't master us. Yeah. But I'll tell you, he left such good memories, including the dollar store. Steve liked the dollar store at Christmas time, everybody. <laughs> He'd go and make sure that Everybody had a Christmas plot. All the kids had toys. Yeah. Always had to have toys. Mm -hmm. He'd take three or four, five hundred dollars out of the bank. He started out with five dollar bills with the little ones. Every yeah. Then it got to ten dollars, you know, and twenty dollars. <laughs> Love Christmas. You can't let Christmas die. It, was his favorite. Um, his friends, he treasured them and he treated them decently. And their friendship, he mastered that too because look at everybody that's here. I mean, he touched your heart or you wouldn't be here. 
this is a story I'm going to tell you that's not nice. <laughs> Might want to cover the little kid's ears. Back in the 70s, women couldn't do men's jobs. Uh, we weren't allowed to work in the mills, um, hardly at the fish plant, never on a boat, but it was happening. There was women working on the boats without tops on. It was getting big. And I thought, God, they can do that. Well, I don't have big enough titties to work on the boat to where I'd make chips, so I couldn't do that. So. I heard that there was a job opening at the Phoenix Reforce Station, and they were hiring. And I thought, I can do that. <laughs> I put in my application, got hired, and I'd get on a crummy about 4 o'clock in the morning with Stephen, Jimmy, sometimes Bob, sometimes Bruce, Jerry Poe. And I thought, how am I going to pull this off <laughs> with all these guys? So they didn't want me there. Steve <laughs> did. Jimmy did. But girls my age didn't do those kind of jobs. And this was a guy thing. You know, they spit everywhere. They pooped everywhere. They smoked their joints, whatever. <laughs> so these guys were trying to intimidate me. And they'd whip out their little Charlie try to pee over my shoulder. Or they'd pull their pants down, take a big old dump in front of me. I'd just sit there. I didn't get up move. I never said a word to them, kept my mouth shut. I said, well, I'm here. It's a job. I can do it. We'd get on the crummy every night. We'd go home. I'd walk through the door and I'd crash right on the couch. Mom, take my boots off. After about two and a half, three weeks of this, Steve comes to me and he says, you know what? I've been thinking about this job that you're on. Will you please quit? I'll pay you to quit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm making money. I'm getting three cents a tree. Are you kidding? I am making good money for a single mom. No, I ain't quitting. He goes, I'll pay your wages, whatever you're making. I said, well, let me think about it. He says, okay. You let me know tomorrow when you don't get on the crummy. I said, oh, I'm, I'm on the crummy. I'm giving them notice. <laughs> so anyhow, he said, because if one more guy whips his Charlie out in front of you, one more guy spits over your head, he says, I'm going to have to knock their effing teeth out. They're my friends, and I don't want to do it. But you're my sister. I said, I'll quit. And you don't have to pay my wages. <laughs> That's just for Steve. I'm going to follow Cindy. Um, I never peed in front of her or took a dump. No, you did. <laughs> Good man. Cindy was the first female tree planter that I knew. I think we had Jimmy working. Dave worked a little bit, a day or two. Steve worked with me for 10 years. Um, I hired him out of Arctic Circle, and like you said, we were friends for the rest of our lives. I said we were friends for the rest of our lives. <laughs> Move closer. <laughs> I've got a ton of Steve stories like the rest of you do. Um, most of them are not suitable for children. A lot of them involved back in the day, excess of alcohol, uh, a lot of illegal activities. A lot of you know those stories too. So um, the story I'm going to tell about Steve, there's a, a story. Um, he had his sayings, like everybody says. Uh, the story that ends with, are we having a situation, uh, showed him as a dominant person. I never saw him angry, but you could tell if you made him angry, you had problems. So the story I'm gonna tell, he's about 18 or 19. We worked together for about 10 years. We were up at Ruprecht Cabins. We had to take a, a ATV to get into there. We're planting trees, and we had these little tumble down cabins that we were camped out in. We also had uh, skunks that would come into the cabin. So Steve, I had just got a 22. 
I had a skunk come into my cabin. I moved out of it. I told him there's a skunk in there. He wanted to shoot it. So he went over and shot it. And he said, okay, now what do I do with it? I said, well, you killed it, skin it. <laughs> so that was a dirty trick, but he skinned it. <laughs> we went over to the other cabin. We had a, a, a planter there named Kelly. And um, he's about 40 years old, so he's an old guy. We were in our 20s, late teens, 20s. And uh, Steve had skinned the skunk. I didn't know he was going to do it. And he opened the door to, to Kelly's cabin and he said, Guess what I did? And Kelly said, Get the hell out of here. You killed a skunk and started retching. <laughs> that was the point where Steve learned that he'd had a trick played on him. I'm guessing he kept the, uh, the skin, but I don't know. Nobody wanted to check it out after that. <laughs> The, the other stories about Steve, um, he had a huge heart, like everybody knows. Uh, he, you made a friend with Steve, and um, it was for life. For life. Yep, here, here. Yeah. So we're all gonna miss him. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. The other story I'd tell would uh, get me arrested. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I had a question about shooting the skunk. My dad shot a couple of them damn things. Yeah, did he skin them? Hell no! Well, they, of course they, not. They squirted that stuff in. Our barn stunk for a month. Steve skunk for several days. Oh, <laughs> I was I was wondering how he done it without getting bad. I mean, you know, and I did. Good. <laughs> a lot of nerve. To, I wouldn't do that. Uh, Steve would. <laughs> Skunks are bad. <laughs> <laughs> it, it got so bad on the knee, Connie, that, I mean, he was having a war with a guy named Johnny. Johnny? Yeah. McCarthy. Yeah. Oh. Johnny Gone! It got so bad, they would sit there and peel the skins off the individual shoes before they would gorge out on them. And then his favorite trick to do was just before you went up there for your wheel oh, wash, he would hunker down in that cloth seat and for about 15 minutes pump fumes into it. <laughs> and then he would come and get you for your watch. And you just get a cup of coffee and go up there and sit down. And <laughs> that, that's one of my favorite things about He's yeah. why I carry on the tradition. Yeah. Yeah, you're, yes, you do a very good job. Very good job. That's Uncle Paul. Right in behind. I got one more good one I got to tell. <laughs> Keep them coming, Paul. I got a really good one. I can't remember the year. Long time ago. You guys remember Chuck Simon of Peovia? Oh, yeah. 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 Here we go. Yeah. A few of them remember. Yeah. So these guys were tree planters, and they cut logs, and they stole this or whatever was in the woods there that they thought they could cut and get away with. And every now and then, a deer would pop up. Kurt to whack. Down goes the deer. Throw it in. Throw some wood on. We're driving through town. So where are they at? They're at the stoplight. Here comes the light in the middle of town. <laughs> Bells up out of the truck. Start screaming and hollering, man, all this crap nerds. Run the light, wham, they run the light. They get going down the hill to Nia Beach, and they slam on the brakes. The deer hits the friggin' back of the window. Steve bells out with a jack and whacks it again and puts it down. They jump in and haul ass, going down the road, trying to get the hell out of town. Just let me see the deer and call the cop and all that. So they finally get to where they're going and said, the son of a bitch and deer got back up again. <laughs> they took an ax and chopped his head off on him. <laughs> And that's a Chuck Simons and Hughley story. <laughs> <laughs> that happened to me twice. Twice. <laughs> twice. Deer came back alive twice. That's what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> you can say that again. <laughs> <laughs>
I don't know which one it was, whether it was the glass house, but we rented a house for years. We lived on the corner of 7th and Benton, and one corner of the house in the living room, the flooring was soft, and we asked the landlord about it, that wacky guy, Ted the barber, and he said, you don't know if it was a he's or the glass house. Brothers lived here, that's where they kept the keg in the living room. <laughs> was that on 6th Street? 7th and Benton. My name's Jerry Poe, and I was a friend of Steve's, and I uh, hope I don't cry, but... A long-time friend. Anyway, just as a testament to Steve's heart and how he treated people, I uh, hadn't spent any time around him for 40 years, and uh, we reconnected recently, and uh, when I got together with him at his house, we were roommates when I was 20, but when I got together with him at his house 40 years later. He treated me just like I was family. I felt so welcome and nothing had changed. Um, he just, he was, he was just like my brother. And that 40 years didn't change a thing about the way he treated me, the time we had together. Um, shortly after that he passed, so. I knew I was going to cry. Tears are love. It's okay. Tears is love. But anyway, I just wanted to say that, that all those decades, I felt so at home and so much of a family and our brother. <clears throat> and uh, he really did have the biggest heart. And he really was like a parent and like a brother and family. And that's just a testament of, of all that time. And uh, shortly after that, he passed. And so there was probably a reason I came and got together with him, a few of us, a few others too. And uh, we even talked about the fact that we wanted to get together real soon because some of us might die. And, and we, we, we knew that, and that was kind of a fact of life, but we didn't think it was gonna be Steve. No, and, and I'm really thankful that I, was able to spend that time with him and uh, with the other people that were there too. Thank you. I'm going to share a story. Um, last winter, Steve came down to Arizona and uh, in fact his motorhome is here in the park somewhere and it's got a new roof on it. And uh, Guy and I were in Arizona and uh, they were coming to see us. It was Paul and Steve and uh, Lyle. And uh, so Steve gives us a call and Guy and I are sitting there and Guy's got the phone on speaker. And uh, he says to, you know how Steve told a story and you didn't, you know, sometimes you didn't know if he was like adding to it or subtracting it. And so he says, yeah, he says, we're driving down the road. The, speed limit was about 60 and I was probably doing 65 and he said up by the corner he said I kept hearing this black 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 and guy and I were listening and he said all of a sudden he said looking in my mirror and the roof to my motorhome just flew off and I really did and guy and I were like like did it really or didn't it and so we started laughing because it was just a hysterical story Steve goes, well, what are you laughing for? He said, cost me a, what was it? Uh, five or six thousand? Eleven Eleven thousand dollars to put the roof back on. But every time Guy and I think about it, it makes us laugh because we got a motor home. And I tell you, if I was down, we're driving down the road and I saw the roof fly off, I would not be laughing. But that was Steve. And I said, Steve, I said, how can you laugh about that? He said, well, it's better than crying. <laughs> and that was just kind of Steve. And uh, anyway, uh, I didn't think the insurance would pay as well as it did, but I'll tell you, Steve was a lot like my husband in that he believed in being insured and he was insured really good. 
and uh, the couple of, what was it, guy, about a month before he was able to get back into the rig? Anyway, in that month's time, uh, it just it just speaks to the kind of person that Steve was, was that the guys that opened, uh, that had this shop, uh, they were Mexicans, and just the nicest guys, and they just fell in love with Steve. So during the day, uh, the, if the if the shop wasn't busy, they would loan Steve their car, and uh, Steve would come over, and we'd go to the different places that we'd go there in Arizona that were that was fun places to visit, and um, we ended up catching up to him. Wasn't it in maybe Lake Havasu, guy? Yep. Was it yep. Lake Havasu? Yep. Well, anyway, so we get down to Lake Havasu, and that's a that's a really fun place, and especially for young men and women during spring break because, um, well, just a lot of bikinis, and uh, they didn't wear tops, they had their tops painted on. And Guy used to joke about, man, would I like to have that job? And Steve says, oh, that's definitely a job for me. He says, I know where I'm gonna be working next spring break. And he's not here, but that's typical of Steve. He could, here he was, his roof blew off his motor home, and he could laugh and joke about things that only Steve would, could make funny. That was just another funny story that I wanted to share about Steve. I really don't have a story because most of the stories I have with Steve would embarrass me. <laughs> but I have never met a person in my life who cared about who he cared for so much. He would, he's the one that would be brutally honest with you. I mean, he was honest, and if you needed to hear it, he would tell you. But he loved each and every one of his nieces and nephews and his brothers and sisters more than anybody I've ever known. And he changed my life. He made me a better person just for knowing him. And I just want you to know how much he loved you all, because he really did. And Jerry, he was so happy to re be reconnected with you. He talked to me about it quite a bit. And, and you, I mean, he was a great guy. And we're all a little less fortunate now that he's gone, but he loved you all. I know he did. We all loved him. Yep. Got a quick antidote. <laughs> you want a, an antidote? Well, here's one. You want to know how many people Steve affected and how many people loved Steve? Go to Bymart. <laughs> Go to Walmart. Walmart. Because I tell you what, man, he could spend four hours in front of the meat counter. That's not even talking about checkout yet. <laughs> I used to head off with Tucker. Tucker and I would go down to the beach. He'd go into, into Walmart. Tucker and I'd get off, you know, from that end of town, walk down to the state park down there, you know, on the beach. much of a bike motorbike rider but he he liked that stuff so I got I got a, a bigger bike bigger than his <coughs> and uh, we rode down to the to the uh, oh what do you call the boat docks in Toledo and we stopped there and got off the bike I put mine up on the kickstand he got up on the bike and he noticed it was too big for him and I said well you, I think you should ride it and he turned to me and in a low whisper said 
Do I have to? <laughs> so I said, no, no, you don't have to. And he got off it, never did write it. But, but you know, Steve and I, we're, we're like brothers. You know, my dad once told me, he said, you judge yourself by the friends and the company you keep. And I know for a fact, that I had a damn good company when I was with Steve. And I can't say the same about me, but I definitely <laughs> can say that about him. And on his deathbed, the thing I whispered to him was, when you get there, get a cooler like the one you used to have and keep it warm there. <laughs> as long as you're in that place, otherwise you can just leave it idle, you know, depending on where you end up, right? <laughs> but. And that was pretty much all I said to him. And I, I just know one thing. One thing I know about Steve is he was just personification of love and also emotion. He was, I mean, you could read him. You could read him. He was pissed at you. You didn't know it. And I always just walked away. And I said, I'll come back and talk to you later. As long as he got out of my way. Right? So if he got out of my way and I walked away and I came back a few hours later or whatever and said, I'd say, are you okay now? And he would say, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So then we'd hug, hug each other and say, I love you. And that's, that's hard for men our age to say without, you know, a, a date or anything, you know, just, <laughs> you know what I mean? No, no dinner, nothing. <laughs> but I really, I, I, honest to God, I wasn't gonna, I, I really had a hard time coming here today. I, I really don't, I don't want to go to my best friend's memorial, but I figured he probably would go to mine. In fact, he'd probably insist that other people go, because that's what he used to do with me, with our old friends, you know, our friends that uh, he would encourage me to go, because he believed in this. He believed in talking about one another this way, yeah. you know? Um, <coughs> I don't want to go into the R-rated stuff because I got a lot of that. I, I don't even want to go there. But um, <laughs> it's funny. The day I got sober, I got in a car wreck, right? Almost killed myself and a bunch of other people at the same time. I guess it was listening on the scanner. <laughs> Mr. Hugley. He, oh, I heard about you. Oh, really? Yeah. What are you going to do? I don't know. Well, maybe you shouldn't drink and drive. How about that? We'll start with that. <laughs> and he was right, you know, he was right. Um, and this is somebody I used to deliver cigarettes to on his senior year because he got too many DUIs and he ended up in the jail and I would take cigarettes to him up in the jail. Because back then you could, when you were 18, you could smoke in the jail. first AA meeting I went to was with Steve. First one, and they had lousy cake. Really lousy. And I didn't understand it. He didn't understand it. I think he was just a little too young at that point to really get it, you know. But it opened my eyes later. And I think later on that saved me. So just, you know, that's all I got to say. Oh. out at Olala Dam when he had that car. Beautiful car. He said, Steve, when you leave, I'm going to show you what this car can do. Down the hill we went flying. He's grabbing gears. You go down the hill and then there's another hill and it's kind of blind. We're hauling ass. Over that hill we go. Here's Denise Monroe's duster parked right in the middle of the road. She's off the side peeing. Oh, boom! <laughs> that was the end of that parachute. <laughs> well, if they would have swerved instead of watching their pee, they probably would have gotten one idea.
damn dog go. My parents say you come over and get the kids all round up. The same thing with my kids and my grandkids. Uh, Tucker, he'd be like, we'd open the front door and he'd be like, get him, Tucker. <laughs> he'd say to the kid, watch out, he only's got one eye. <laughs> I really do remember that. Yeah, he always, he's the best, uncle. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was. Yeah. Megan? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember when I was young, showing up with these things. I was going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good story a about the boys, how true it was. Mm -hmm. That never came. <laughs> mm. When I look back at Steve and how he lived his life, he always showed up. He came to your house unannounced. Yeah. He wait for an invitation. He would call. <laughs> he just showed up. And I thought, you know, I need to be more like Uncle Steve. I just need to show up. It's okay to show up if people are sick and not well. You show up. Love your people. Yeah. No, it's not. He did love us. Well. Um, uh, in fact, one of the last uh, phone calls that maybe he got from Uncle Steve. Well, yeah, he that's one of the reasons. But the that's the moving and home thing started before that. that so. Coming home, he was fine. Yeah, but she went to the doctor the other day. When she's thinking about maybe the same thing. Should be close to the yeah, hospital. Yeah, and within hours, mm -hmm. we're getting a phone call to be there. Close to family, close to people that want to go to Portland to take supplies. She's still driving and stuff. 
Yeah, but she didn't do a very good job. Not by far. I got to interject on the CUDA story. <laughs> was with Steve at the light there in front of the old Safeway, and there was a guy named Allie. He had these pickups that were real fast. He really souped them up. It was a yellow Datsun or something. We just happened to be at the light right with him. There it was. The race was on. That CUDA was a full race deal. That thing was fast. So we took off. Steve gave it everything he had, and that, that yellow truck beat him. And Steve could not believe it all night long. He was on and on about how could that guy beat me, you know. But that was a successful race where we didn't crash. It was right in the middle of town, right on 101. I'll remember it was a weekend night. But, man, he gave that Cuda everything it had to try to beat that guy. And uh, I was in the passenger seat, but it was just a, I didn't remember it till he was talking about driving in it. But it was a full race. It would go, bop, 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 and, and when he gave it everything, it was really... That was the true Steve when he was really in his prime with the Cuda and just out racing. <laughs> it was really something. But that guy beat him. Steve couldn't. He, he goes, that guy, that guy's a fast car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is another story about how glad, close the Glasscock and Hughleys are. And, uh, Steve had just got back from Alaska. He called me and said, hey, I got a bunch of fish. You want some fish? And I'm like, hell yeah. And so he said, well, probably next couple days I'll come out. And uh, a couple days later he comes out. We're having a big family barbecue. My mom and dad are there. And he shows up and he's like all nervous. He comes up and he's like, well, you know, I didn't know you were having a family get together and having a barbecue. My dad goes over and grabs him, gave him a big hug, and he says, well, don't you know your family too, Steve? There you go. Thank you. Okay, so... I was listening to Megan, and I remember that big video camera too, you know, and him going, what are you doing, what are you doing? And all the kids were fighting over it and everything, and uh, yeah, I also, also remember him, he'd take videos when he was out on the ocean, you know, and you can just hear him out there, you know, oh, it's shitty weather and stuff, and uh, I hear about all these nice cars and everything, and uh, Uncle Steve always had, you know, a beater truck or something, you know, and I, yeah, and, I can't tell you how many of those I wrecked, you know, and <laughs> and him just be, and like, I would avoid him forever, man. I'd be like, you know, make up some excuse, and he'd show up, just like you said, and I'd be like, fuck, you know, and um, and he would always just be, I don't know, just let me borrow another truck or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, uh, that's just the kind of guy he was, you when know. When did you guys learn to get your driver's license then? Yeah, and um, I just... And at one time he just showed up and he had this little truck and he's parked and I see him comes inside and I see his truck go flying down the hill and like I'm like oh fuck Uncle Steve's out here quickly and I was like and he comes running out running after his truck and he didn't have an e-brake on or something you know <laughs> he always had these beater trucks that he drove around you know the only one nice car I remember is his Mustang you know and uh, and uh, you know I just. <laughs> I know that he's up there kicking ass, you know, and uh, I just miss him. Uh, I'm glad you're all here, and I'm happy to be here. And thank you. Stroke in 2008. Jesse was the first one there. And uh, all the way through the stroke, while I was in the hospital, while I was in the rehab center, who was there, like, all the time. You know, when I got a little bit better and I could start going out of there, he started taking me home to his house regularly. You know, my brother Steve never once in my life ever made me feel like an inconvenience. He never made me feel like a piece of shit. He always made me feel like I was right in front of him, no matter what was going on, no matter, you know, no matter what. And you know something? I saw him do that in a tremendous amount of people's lives. I mean, he made a big difference in people's lives that other people would have made, you know? But not Steve, because that's the kind of person he was. He 
took on the people and hard projects, knowing that sometimes the results that you get might not be exactly what you want. But you know, he's the kind of person you still look at. And the biggest thing I can tell you about it, and I know you'll never understand this, but I was about eight years old when my 14 year old sister died. And you know, it was a pretty sad time. And uh, we were at the funeral home, and uh, you know, what was going on. And my brother Steve gave me a hug. I don't know what it was about that hug <coughs> my brother Steve. Just something for that very moment. And, uh, you know, uh, he was a rock in my life. He really was. He lived right next door to me, and I felt like I was a little bit safer because he was there. You know? And, and now he ain't there. And, uh, you know, that's a big hole for everybody. But it was a really big hole for me. You know, I used to go visit him, and here's one for you. I talk a lot and I carry on a lot and I move around a lot. So I'd sit outside in the yard and he'd have his window open and I'd sit out there and visit with him because I didn't want to get on his nerves. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I had a good relationship with Steve. And, uh, you know, how big of a hole is that in my life? Well, how about like this? Because I'm still trying to figure out. You know, I love you as much as all you guys. Here. Keep it clean. <laughs> yeah. Anybody that knows me knows Steve was my best friend ever, ever. And uh, most of our stories are X-rated, so I could tell them all. But, uh, I guess I'll start out with you, Sheila. Remember when you bought that house? Steve hired me to roof it. He said, "Come over tomorrow. I got to go to work, but come over." And I think Sheila's dad, Bud, is going to help you. I said, oh, cool. Well, I went out and I got, he paid me early. He always love, did. Love I had all this money. I went to the bar. I got drunk. Or so. so I show up about 7 in the morning, man. I, I could hardly walk. So her dad shows up, bud. Steve goes, all right, get this three tab on. I'll go to work. I'll be back. So we climb up the ladder and uh, I think we put about, as soon as Steve left, we put about two sheets. The sun came out. And uh, Bud goes, God damn, it feels good, don't it? Like, yeah. <laughs> Next thing I know, we're spooning, sleeping on the <laughs> And I ain't kidding you. We heard Steve's car. Remember that? His car came up, and I'm hugged up to her dad's. I mean, I was really hung over that day. Said, what time is it, man? We slept four hours on the road. <laughs> and I tell you what, that's mad as Steve ever got at me. But, uh, so we got through that, and then uh, right after that, you know, I was getting in a lot of trouble back then. The cops were chasing me. So I thought Steve always left his door open. And, Shit, I'm Go up this hill, park my truck, we're in the house. You know, it's about midnight, Christmas Eve. Oh man, here comes the cops. There's like six cop cars come up there. <laughs> Steve and Sheila didn't even know I was there. So I walked in the bedroom, opened the door. And they, what are you doing here? And they go, I want to wish you guys a Merry Christmas because I'm going to jail. He's <laughs> he he trying, trying to get just what the hell's going on? And then the, the door opens up, and I'm right behind Steve, and they go, We're looking for Lyle here. I go, oh, he ran out the backyard. And she goes, no, he didn't. He's right here. Get that <laughs> well, I went to jail for that one. <laughs> and uh, then another story is uh, I had this old land landlord named Abbott. Yeah, he was a mean old sucker. I was about 12. Steve was 13. Or Steve was 12. I was like 10 or 11. Steve's an old guy. He'd call me a little son of a gun and yell at me and stuff. Steve a goes, bastard. Yeah, a little bastard. <laughs> So Steve goes, hey, let's, let's get some squirt guns and go over and squirt that old man. So the old guy would keep his window open on his trailer, and he'd stand there and drink beer and yell out the window at him. So I, we were playing Army, so I snuck up there. I go, hey, Abbott. He goes, what do you want, you little son of a bitch? I backed up. Steve's laughing his ass. I squirt him. While I'm walking back to the back porch, you no know, Abbott opened up the door. He's about an 80-year-old man. He had a 22 rifle. Goes, Boom! And it had birdshot in it. I landed on the floor. I never seen Steve for three days. <laughs> My best friend, he left me. <laughs> but anyway, he was always my banker, you know, because I always paid him back. And this last time before I died, I owed him 600 bucks. You know, we went to uh, 
Arizona on his trip. And said, you better pay me, Lyle. <laughs> so I showed up there and I paid him. And a week later, he died. Mm. And I remember before he died, I grabbed his hand. I said, uh, we're even now, buddy. <laughs> sure love that guy. Call him every Mother's Day. You know, thank him for all the stuff he did. I just, I don't know why I did, but I call him on Mother's Day. It's kind of a joke. And now I'll be calling Paul here, because Paul's, Paul's my new banker. <laughs> Sorry, Steve. All right. That's all I, get. I love that guy. Yeah. What? I got to tell you how proud I am of you. Why? I've never heard you speak to anybody and put your beer down. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. 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 I didn't tell the part where he said, You died, I'm going to ask you, but I didn't do that. <laughs> Only that's a joke between me and you. Remember that? So it reminds me, you know, it's a story. So you're mine. Like, get out of here, Bruce. <laughs> so we were uh, talking about <laughs> driving and All right. vehicles get it out and stuff. We lived up, we had some property up in Newport yeah. Heights yeah. when we were yeah. like young teens. Yeah. And he had this old Honda Civic car. We <laughs> called it the Honda truck. The Honda truck. The boys called it the Honda truck. Did you guys actually drive the truck? Where's Sean at? Or the car? Did he? That little gray car? Yeah. 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 It was a tin can. Yeah, you called it the tin can. We called it So he would let the boys drive that vehicle all, all over our property. They're just like little kids, you know? And there was a Honda. Oh, Uncle Steve's here. The Honda truck's here. Yay! You know? Get Aunt Cindy a root beer. And uh, it reminded me of uh, one time he had this little Mitsubishi kind of sporty car or something. And Sean, was it you that was driving it? So he, Sean borrowed it or something or other, and they pulled up in our driveway, and it was kind of a hill. And uh, Steve went out. So Sean parked it. Steve went out to get his car or whatever, and he's like, well, where's the car? He's like, well, I just parked it right out there. And he's like, no, it's not out there. Well, the car it left it neutral, put the e-brake on. E-brake didn't work. Went, rolled down the hill, went into the ravine, you know. Um, and it kind of, it's kind of, kind of how it was. He, you know, he just was everybody's favorite. Yeah. Remind me of that story. Got any more? Got yeah, one last song I want to play. Just one more up in the tail. One more? No, go ahead. Oh, okay. Come on. Tell, I heard you say something. I've been dying. Tell. I've been dying to tell this yeah. one. Hey, keep me Everybody's been me. talking about how nice Steve is and how great Steve is. <laughs> And this story, I don't mean to offend any Christians here or any Catholics. We were out tree planting, and we had quite a few of our inspectors were Christian. I mean, very, very strict religious. And they wouldn't cuss. And Steve bet them a dollar that he could get them to cuss. So he was doing everything in his power for a week straight to get them to cuss. And um, one day, one of them was doing something and he bent over and he was doing something down on the ground and he was fiddling around, doing something with trees or something. And Steve ran over there and grabbed him between the legs and <laughs> gave him a pinch. <laughs> now that's about as bad as I know Steve to ever get. But that guy, he jumped up and he turned around and he went, you mother. <laughs> and he didn't say it. And Steve was just egging him on. Come on, come on, say it, say it. He never said it, so Steve lost a dollar. <laughs> but that's, I have more, but that's the one I'm going to tell. Come on, tell us about one. No. Almost guy. Yeah, no. <laughs> 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 
Down so, so I I'm not talking, I'm just giving him some stuff. Pointing like there's a deer. They come down there. I'm sitting on the couch. These two walk up over there. Jesus Christ, what'd you do? I took a big old dump. That's it. I got a better chip story than that. I don't know how old I was. Mike Campbell was alive. The glass cocks were hunting. Uh, we had a hell of a crew. Bill was in there. The corn binder. Uh, the tooth fairy. That's all I was. But I have to camp Rick it all up. Ah! So we're going hunting. And Bud had a camper, and I said, the guy says, sure got a small water tank. He goes, sure does. Didn't think much of it. So we're out camping up there at Click and Tat about a day later. Gurgle, gurgle. <laughs> I don't feel good. Drinking beer. I had bad beer. Maybe it was that whiskey I had for breakfast. Whatever it was, he drank. A whole bunch was there. I mean, we'd go out there and be, I would say, on the leaf, four gallons of whiskey and about 20 cases of beer to start the day. And we had coffee the morning and this and that and the afternoon went on and it's time to go hunt. We hunted the next day and my guts are killing me. I'm going, God, we're sitting there playing this stupid crib game. And my gut, and I, I throw the cards down and haul out. I go, I gotta go. I'm hauling, ripped my, and voila, blew her all out, felt pretty good. 
So I picked up the freezer suit, went like this, and shit flew all over me. <laughs> everywhere. Shit everywhere. So I take them back off. I unzip the son of a gun and throw it. And I took, turned it inside out, and I threw it on Dale's pickup. <laughs> and it was torn down right out. Hell, I don't clean it. <laughs> Dale comes up the next day and goes, well, who the hell threw these here? And he said he grabbed it. Holy shit. Got a handful of shit, and he coming and asked me what happened. I told him, hey, when I hauled ass out of here, remember I told you I was sick? And he goes, yeah. I go, I whipped them babies down. I sat down and blew shit everywhere. I whipped it back up. It dumped all over me. And hell, your truck was the closest thing there to cleaning it. <laughs> and that was that. And that was. Uh, yeah, but then the game wardens came up. Well, that's different. They're like, what the hell? That was, was Bud. This? <laughs> Bud had. Here's how it happened. His tank wasn't small. He never drained the water for three years. We got oh a belly, God. a bad, bad belly. This old guy was shitting all. We had to move. We had to move the whole camp. God damn bug. And like Steve said, the cops show up and they look at me like, what in the hell happened out here? I said, well, you got bad water. And then we lost it for what, a day and a half? Yeah, another, another shit story. There you go. Oh, you going to tell the other one? Yeah, you oh, God. Yeah, I'm going to tell the story. Cause he was there, and I want to witness to this, and it was the funniest thing I've ever seen. Now I gotta put the beer down. All right, I'll put the okay, beer down. So anyway, we're in Lake Havasu. <laughs> this last time we went on a vacation. Yeah, just new shit. In the motorhome. Eight weeks ago, ten weeks ago. So Paul is in the motorhome doing dishes. I'm sitting. Up. We just had breakfast. I'm sitting on the couch having a beer. The door is wide open. Here comes Steve waddling back. And when he gets up in there, he walks by me, and there's a tag hanging out on his sweatpants. Said, hey, fucker, you get, or hey, sucker, you got your tag hanging out. So he goes like this. He couldn't do it. And Paul, there, I'll help you. That's tag. So Paul walks over there. He grabs it. It's toilet paper. And he pulls it. And he goes, son of a bitch. He pulls it again. Another six, 12 feet. Eight feet. By then, I was on the floor. On my back, I looked like a crab. I was laughing so hard, I couldn't even breathe. And he kept going. And pretty soon, Paul goes, I'll be a son of a bitch, I'm done. <laughs> he cut it off, and there was still more. And Steve, the only thing Steve could figure out, he said, when I go to the bathroom, I like to use a lot of toilet paper. When he's rolling, it was going to the leg of his pants. He didn't know it. <laughs> so, man, there's probably about 50 feet of toilet paper. Because I said, who could pee through that much toilet paper? There's no way in hell. But I couldn't breathe. So the next day, me and Paul go to the bar at the uh, Elks campground there. And uh, we, we stayed till close that We were... There was only one truck in the parking lot. Thank God that one truck And was he there. couldn't walk, I couldn't walk. We were hugging on each other. And we were almost to the, <laughs> the motorhome and we brought up that toilet paper story. Oh man, we fell on the ground, we were laughing so hard. So I get Paul up and I get him to the motorhome with a Steve had shut the door and went to bed. So I'm hanging on to Paul and they open the door and you gotta push a button for the stairs to come out. When it hit the button, the stairs came out and knocked Paul underneath the <laughs> another trailer. Underneath the trailer, I'm looking at it, and then here comes here comes Steve. Underwear. Almost. He's got these bikini underwear. He's belly down. He comes to the door. He comes to the door, and I'm standing. No, I'm, I'm sick of babysitting these sons of bitches. Where's my brother? I go. He's underneath the trailer. <laughs> and then he slams the door, and things go back in. Again. I had a hell of a time getting him into the trailer, but oh man. I'll never forget, he, he looked pretty sexy in them bikinis. <laughs> he was madder than hell, though, because he sound asleep, you know. Where'd my brother yeah, stay? I, there he is the I threw him under the bus. But I, I had to have him with me with the 12, 12 people. Yeah, that was a good one. Yeah, yeah. All right, anybody else got any shit stories you want to tell? Yeah, I got one more. <laughs> me and Karen are walking oh, through some yeah. damn hospital. Where are hospital? We were at the hospital of all places. And this guy walks by and he's got the biggest long pile of toilet paper flapping behind him. He's kind of a worker, you know, pushing a basket and shit. Acting real cool. Hey, 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 I gotta tell you something because what, 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 no. you got an ass wipe hanging clear out to about 10 feet behind him. And the guy looks and goes, holy shit. And he just walked through the whole hospital like that. No, he started tucking it in. He tried to tuck it in. How the hell do you tuck in toilet paper stuck behind you? I could snap it off and walk away. So that's it. My banker. My banker. <laughs> my new, my new banker.
All right, one last song and yeah, one last song, then one. So, make sure folks that don't sign the books. We know who came because I, I don't know that I know everybody. And take a little deal with those obituary and whatnot. Um, I'm going to play one last song. I really want you to listen to the lyrics to this because... I can hardly listen to this song without crying. When I first heard this song, <clears throat> it made me ball and ball and ball. But then, at the same time, it, it healed my heart. Okay? Because it has a way of doing it. And so I want you to. Tell me what does it is it peaceful? Is it free like they say? Does the sun shine bright forever? Have your fears and your pain gone away? Cause here on earth it feels like everything.